Hello everyone. I hope that you and your families are safe and well. I also sincerely hope that you are embracing uh, the positives in your lives during these difficult times. Welcome to the International Consortium for Values-Based Governance or ICVG webinar. It is titled Robust Alternatives to the Corporation. Now, before I introduce our webinar speaker and uh, the moderator, I would wish to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nation on whose land we are gathered today. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Our webinar speaker for today is uh, Professor Jerry Davis, uh, the Gilbert and Ruth Whitaker Professor of Business Administration and Professor of Sociology at the University of Michigan. He is also the Associate Dean of Business and Impact at the Ross School of Business uh, at the University of Michigan, and is currently on sabbatical as a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. Professor Davis uh, received his PhD from the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University and has taught at Northwestern and Columbia Universities. Professor Davis's research is broadly concerned with the corporation as a social and economic vehicle, and he has published widely in management, sociology, and finance. He has and continues to serve on the editorial board of several leading journals, most recently being in the role of uh, editor-in-chief of the Administrative Science Quarterly. He has also written several books. Two of his recent books are Changing Your Company from the Inside Out, a guide for social intrapreneurs from, by the Harvard Business School Review Press, and The Vanishing American Corporation by Barrett Kohler. His current book project examines corporate power in the 21st century and how to tame it. And I believe that today's webinar's insights are uh, drawn from his most recent books and also the research that and work he's been, he has done since that book as well. So it's uh, quite recent as well. All right, and our webinar moderator for today is Professor Michael Mintram, who is a professor of public policy and the inaugural director of Monash University's Better Governance and Policy, a campus-wide research focus area. Professor Mintram was professor of public sector management, uh, fully seconded from Monash University to the Australia and New Zealand School of Government, which is also called ANSOP. There, he served as academic director of the acclaimed Executive Master of Public Administration degree offered in collaboration with multiple university partners. Professor Mintram holds a PhD in political science from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. He has worked at Michigan State University and the University of Auckland. He is also an authority on public policy processes and advocacy and has conducted influential research on policy entrepreneurship. His recent books include Public Policy, Investing for a Better World by Oxford University Press, and Policy Entrepreneurs and Dynamic Change by Cambridge University Press. Okay, so now I invite Professor Davis to give his talk, which will last around uh, 35 to 40 minutes or so, followed by a Q&A, which will be moderated by Professor Mintram. So please post any questions or comments you have in the Q&A sec uh, section, and then Professor Mintram will uh, coordinate that and, um, and, uh, and post your questions or comments later on. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Over to you, Professor Davids. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Christo Karuna. I'm really, uh, really excited, and Professor Karuna and Michael Minton have joined us here today, and I'm grateful to the new International Consortium for Values-Based Governance. I think it's a really wonderful initiative. I'm really excited to be in on this uh, at the ground floor. So I'm coming to you today from uh, Menlo Park, California, in the heart of Silicon Valley, just a few blocks from Sand Hill Road, which is the land of venture capital and IPOs. Uh, and all day today, we have had an orange sky uh, due to smoke from wildfires all over California that have been casting a pall over the environment. And this is what things looked like earlier today in San Francisco. And I'm afraid this may turn out to be a heavy handed metaphor for a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about uh, in today's talk. So there will be a bit of a pall and an apocalyptic orange glow uh, to some of what I have to say today. So, so that was a pretty spot on. 
Uh, the talk in a nutshell, if you're already sort of falling asleep from, from what I have to say, the, the short version of this is that public corporations are disappearing uh, in the US and the UK and uh, possibly elsewhere. And that's a bit of a puzzle. So I wanna unpack that at first. I'm gonna claim that information and communication technologies or ICTs are reducing the cost of using the outside markets that corporations rely on uh, relative to doing activities inside the corporate boundary. So I'll talk about Nikeification, which is outsourcing production to suppliers, uh, Uberization, a newer thing, which is outsourcing labor using uh, software, uh, Amazon, to, uh, which is a distribution market. And I'm gonna argue that one of the logical things that will sort of result from this is the creation of a web page enterprise where technology goes inside the firm itself and replaces management with algorithms. So that's gonna sound a little bit psychedelic. And I'll end on a bit more of a hopeful note, which is to argue that what comes next is really up to us, that it is a political choice and an organizational design choice. It's not that firms just arise from nowhere, but that we really have a big say over, uh, over what these beasties look like. So, so hang on for that. Um, uh, Christo mentioned my last book, The Vanishing American Corporation. And, and the puzzle behind this book was, why are public corporations in the US vanishing? So shocking fact is that between 1997 and 2011, the number of listed corporations in the US dropped by half and it has not come back in spite of the Jobs Act, in spite of various deregulatory efforts to make it easier to go public. Um, they're just sort of bumping around uh, at this very low level. And your first thought would be, everybody knows that's because of industry consolidation, giants are buying other giants, and markets are becoming more concentrated. And I won't go through this extremely complicated slide, uh, but I looked at every corporation that's listed on US markets from 20, uh, 2000 until a couple of years ago, and it really is not a simple story of consolidation industry by industry. There's a lot of variation going on. Uh, in the chat, there will be a link to the, uh, the paper that unpacks this and shows where they did, but, but it's really not a simple story uh, of, of consolidation across industry. There's really a lot of different factors going on. And one way we can think about this, uh, uh, the consolidation story, is to look at the Dow Jones blue chip companies. So 1988, this was the list of the blue chip solid vanguard of American capitalism, the 30 companies listed uh, in the Dow Jones Index. If you were to fast forward to today, you would discover the ones that are left in the index uh, are those in red. So fewer than half uh, of the companies are still left in the index. Um, some of them are still limping along. A lot of them have disappeared. Anyone under the age of uh, 40 probably doesn't remember Westinghouse or Woolworth or American Can or Navistar. Uh, some of them still live on, but kind of in a, in, in a bit of a reduced state. So for me, it's kind of like going to your 30-year high school reunion, and these were the kids that were the football team. They were sort of the, the, the pride of the school, the, the big popular kids, and you go back to your 30-year reunion, and a bunch of them have disappeared, and the rest of them have gone to sea. They got a balding and uh, going obese, and you know, GE used to be like the quarterback, and now it looks like it just got out of rehab and we're not so certain about it. So it's not just that there's a sort of consolidation among the biggest firms, something else is going on. If you're a fan of uh, Schumpeter, which many people in business schools are, you'll say, hooray, it's, uh, it's uh, creative destruction. The old guys are disappearing and they're being replaced by new companies, but that really isn't the case either. So this is a uh, clocking of the number of IPOs per year from 1980 until last year uh, from Jay Ritter's database. And what you see is that the IPO fad of the 1990s has never really revived. In fact, if you add up the number of public corporate, the number of companies going public in the past five years in the US, it's still less than went public in 1996 alone. So we're really facing this interesting situation where public corporations seem to be uh, evaporating. And so that was a bit of a puzzle. Uh, one question you'd reasonably ask is, well, why do we have public corporations in the first place? Germany doesn't seem to need nearly as many public corporations. They have about 600 now, and they had about 630 years ago. So there are different ways of doing business, but why do we have these things in the first place? And a reasonable place for any of us to start is Ronald Coase's famous 1937 article, uh, The Nature of the Firm. 
so he was wondering, why do we have firms instead of markets? Uh, we all know that markets are efficient, that allocate resources to their highest valued uses. If that's true, then why do people show up for a 40-hour work week? Why do we see giant vertically integrated firms all over the economy? And his short answer, of course, was transaction costs, that there is a cost to using markets, that even free markets are not free. There's a cost to using them. So he famously said the main reason uh, that it's profitable to establish a firm would seem to be that there's a cost of using the price mechanism. The most obvious cost of organizing production through the price mechanism is that of discovering what the relevant prices are. It's just expensive to shop for new suppliers and to find new vendors and to snap these things together. And so because of those transaction costs of organizing through the market, we saw things like uh, this lovely Ru River Rouge factory in Dearborn, Michigan. So when, uh, uh, when Coase was writing in 1937, both of my grandfathers worked as welders in this very factory, the River Rouge. Uh, it was the most vertically integrated factory the world had ever seen. You saw sort of coal and iron uh, and sand going in one, one end and cars rolling out the other end, Model A's at the time. Uh, and Coase's explanation is transaction costs. Uh, the, the, the cheapest per unit cost is gonna be large scale, vertically integrated mass production and having employees clocking in and clocking out uh, year after year. And that's why we had things that looked like this. But imagine if Coase is right, that that's the reason why we have corporations or, or firms, uh, imagine this thought experiment where everybody carried with them a tiny supercomputer communicator that allowed them to look up the prices for everything in the world costlessly all day, every day, and they could create contracts for inputs with random strangers and track their performance in real time. In other words, transaction costs went to near zero. Well, we are now living through that very experiment right now. Um, thanks to information and communication technologies, it is a lot cheaper to shop through supply markets. Uh, what would become of that, you would get pervasive outsourcing of the production of goods and services. And I've labeled this Nikeification. I believe I am now the legal owner of the word Nikeification, because if you Google Nikeification, like nine of the 10 top uh, uh, hits that you get are references to me. So I'm very proud that I've accomplished this one thing in life. But Nike famously has never made the sneakers with its name on it. It has always imported sneakers from third party vendors and put their own swoosh on it. They saw themselves as being an intellectual property company that did design uh, and marketing, but they didn't really do the manufacturing. I'm here to tell you that uh, Nike's model has taken over the American economy entirely. It's without much exaggeration, almost nothing you buy in the United States today was made by the company whose name is on the label. So Vizio, uh, 10 years ago, came to be the biggest selling brand of television in the United States, essentially driving Sony out of business with 196 employees in Irvine, California. They just, they realized that the parts for a flat screen TV were commodities, kind of like Dell did with computers. And so put together a distribution deal through big box retailers and finding a vendor, a Taiwanese vendor in China that could, uh, could assemble them. Uh, mobile phones, we all know that Apple doesn't manufacture iPhones, Foxconn does, and that's true pretty broadly throughout uh, the electronics industry. Pet food, most of the pet foods in the US are manufactured by a Canadian company called Menu Foods in Ontario. It's all the same horse parts. They just put different labels on it for, for different brands of, uh, uh, of cat food and dog food. Tomato sauce, I learned that on the grounds of the former Eastman Kodak factory in Rochester, New York is a company called Demestri that makes almost every brand of tomato sauce. So, so Christo, if you had your favorite grandma's recipe for delicious tomato sauce, you can send these guys a recipe and they will make your recipe and put your label on it and get it into stores through this highly automated tomato sauce factory that has about 10 people wandering around on the floor. Uh, heparin the blood thinner is made by third party vendors. CIA assassinations. It turns out you cannot even trust the name on a CIA assassination anymore. They're also using vendors like Blackwater uh, and of course rides to the airport. But seriously, you can find vendors for everything. It is very cheap on your phone to shop for different flavors of vendors. Um, 
Okay, so it's easy to visualize what I'm describing for suppliers. ICTs have made shopping for suppliers very cheap. That seems like it's not necessarily going to apply so well to labor. How could you use the same model for labor markets? And it is not too much of a stretch to say there really is an Uber for everything now. This is an article in the Wall Street Journal five years ago where the author says, I've got a maid, masseuse, doctor, chef, valet, personal shopper, florist, and bartender. Each has his own app and can arrive at my door in as little as 10 minutes. Um, so there really is an Uber for everything. Living in Silicon Valley, absolutely anything that one human being can do for another, anything, there is an app for that. If you are not capable of parallel parking your own Tesla, uh, you can press an app and some kid will show up on a skateboard and park your car for 10 bucks. It's uh, quite amazing what's out there. And I think what's important about Uberization is not that you can get a cheaper ride to the airport. I'm defining Uberization as the creation of spot labor markets enabled by smartphones in which buyers and sellers can, con can contract for the performance of specific tasks. So the importance of Uberization is not cheap ride to the airport. It is a creation of spot labor markets for tasks for sp performance of specific activities. And um, I checked and apparently you don't have a Home Depot like we do in, in the US and Australia. You have something called Bunnings, uh, Bunnings Warehouse, giant warehouse where you can buy all the different parts. So this is the equivalent to that in the US, uh, the Home Depot. And if you show up at a Home Depot between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. any day in the US, you will find a bunch of young men kind of like this hanging around in a corner. And the first time you see it, you think, is this um, a cult? Or are they playing Pokemon Go? What are these guys doing hanging around there? It turns out to be a spot labor market. If you wanna hire people through less than legal means and you wanna pay them cash for the day, you go to the Home Depot parking lot. Everybody understands that as the place where you shop and you show up and say, I wanna to put together, I'm, I'm assembling a garage in somebody's yard. I need somebody who can lay cement. That's $120 for the day. I need a carpenter. That's $90 for a day. I got a roofer. That's $75 for a day. And you show up and you can recruit a crew for the day. They jump in the back of your truck. You show up at the work site. You bring them back at the end of the day, pay them cash. And uh, it's a little bit less than legal, but it's a very common way of using uh, labor by the day. Uh, that's the setup for the most hilarious cartoon ever published in the New Yorker. <laughs> it's a bunch of uh, white guys hanging around in the uh, office depot parking lot saying, okay, I'm good for IT. How about spreadsheets? Anybody good uh, here good at spreadsheets? Uh, it's funny because it's true because this is literally what goes on at Google in a sense. They have about 120,000 actual employees, but something like 150,000 temps, vendors, and contractors or TVCs you recognize them because they have a, a red name tag rather than the official name tag, and they're not treated quite as well as the full-time employees. In other words, most of the people that work at Google do not work for Google. Um, they are vendors or contractors. What I want to say about Uberization is that Uberization turns the world into a Home Depot parking lot. And the significance of it is going to go beyond individuals finding individual vendors to park their car for them when it gets into the corporate world as it will. And I think this is something that we can anticipate in the not too distant future is the use of contracting and even bidding uh, for shifts in the not too distant future. So um, one of the difficulties of something like uh, using Uber for other tasks is how do you evaluate people? And uh, if you go to the Singapore airport and you go through the, the uh, customs line, they ask you to rate the person on a five-star scale. There's a Black Mirror episode that takes this to its logical conclusion. What if you rated everybody all day for everything? So every time at the end of this talk, a little uh, uh, app pops up on your phone and you're asked to rate me on a five-star scale and that goes into my, uh, my talk Yelp or something like that. It is not difficult to imagine that the next time you show up at, uh, at your local grocery store, that when someone helps you or you go through the line, something will pop up on your phone and say, we will give you 10% discount on the following items if you will rate this person. And so we'll add a sort of quality control component to everyday interactions with people in the service sector. And so you can imagine a sort of utopian or dystopian thought experiment uh, which would be employee-free Walmart. 
Um, so at the moment, Walmart's the biggest employer in the world. They have about 2.2 million employers, uh, employees that they call associates, not employees or workers. But suppose that they wanted to make Wall Street happy by going lean, really lean, and getting rid of their workforce. So you could imagine their associates transitioning to self-employed micro-entrepreneurs, each one organized as an LLC, as if they were an individual firm, which already happens in uh, various parts of the contractor economy. And instead of Walmart training them, they would self-fund their own training. We will call that investment in their human capital. Uh, and that might be done by community colleges or by third party vendors like Amazon. And they'll get certification for specific sorts of work, like specific roles like checkout or warehouse or shelf stocking. And for each of them, they're gonna have a rating on a five star scale. So their evaluations are automated, combining how quick are they at checking people out, but also smartphone based customer ratings. And so you have an aggregate rating the way that your Uber driver does. And here's the uh, part that's either magical, if you love the novels of Ayn Rand, uh, or a nightmarish hell, um, if you're over the age of 22, um, which is that you could have people using this app to bid for shifts within commutable distance. So imagine on Sunday, I decide I wanna figure out what my schedule for the week is gonna be. I open the app and it tells me, here's all the stores within um, a, a 30 kilometer distance. Uh, and I'm gonna bid for different shifts that I am uh, qualified for. And so instead of having a fixed wage, you would have bidding, the low bidders would win. And so you could imagine on Mondays, everybody wants to work and the low bid could be below the minimum wage. Saturday nights, nobody wants to work and you might have something like surge pricing, but you could see wages and shifts fluctuating week to week in this sort of online market. And of course, in the US, we would say, be your own boss, choose your own hours, codependent no more, you're now a micro entrepreneur. I think in the civilized world, it might get a bit of a different reaction. So I gave this thought experiment uh, last year uh, to a group of Canadian executives and CEOs and stuff. And they said, absolutely not. This is a ridiculous thought experiment. This will never happen. Within one month of giving this talk, uh, a new app appeared, Why My Walmart Schedule, which allows Walmart associates to swap ships with each other and to change their ships around using the app. So that to me is the, the Trojan horse. Shortly after that, Uber launched a new app to connect job seekers with temporary shifts. And so if you wanna go work in a restaurant, you're a guard manger or a salad baker or a dishwasher, you can go to this Uber app and it'll tell you, um, here's how you need to dress, here's where you show up, uh, and here's the, uh, uh, here's the wage being offered. So already the, the, my, my ridiculous thought experiment has a couple of things going for it. And I could see this becoming much more plausible uh, in the not too distant future. And in some sense, the, I, I mean, there, there is something anti-economic about wages being the same all day, every day, right? They're not really responding to market forces. You get well, let's say $15 an hour day in and day out. Um, and there's something odd about that. Shouldn't it be varying with demand or with other factors? And so this seems like a vehicle to create a market. This is why I say that the, the, what's important about Uberization is not the ride to the airport, but the breaking down of the boundaries around, uh, around labor markets. Okay, so this works for suppliers and laborers. What about distribution? And that one has an easy answer, which is Amazon. Um, everyone in the world today, if you care to, you can start selling on Amazon tomorrow. Um, it's created a marketplace uh, for distribution and fulfillment by Amazon. We'll pick the stuff up at the warehouse for you, collect the fees from, uh, uh, from your customers and so on. They've really taken the entire distribution channel and made it modular. So that you don't have to touch the stuff uh, that you are selling to your customers. So it really takes that whole channel and makes it accessible. Um, Interestingly, this is a lovely article from a couple of years ago that's terrifying if you work at a business school as I do. It's describing how there's an entire industry of micro enterprises, uh, you know, in, in sad warehouses in the East Bay around here, where two or three people will go on to Amazon, they will find goods that seem overpriced, like a dongle or something where you think, why does it cost that much? Um, they're making too much profit here. And so the entrepreneurs will find, find a contractor to make a design for them, go to alibaba.com and find a contractor to manufacture it, enlist it on fulfillment by Amazon. Um, and 
as long as they get good ratings, if the quality is good and their Amazon ratings are good, then they will essentially drive the name brand out of business. This is terrifying if you're a name brand. Uh, if you're Belkin and you're selling dongles for 50 bucks and suddenly you've got this no brand vendor selling it for 12 and it's just as good, you're pretty much doomed. Um, what this has done is unleashed an entire industry of people who aren't really an industry. Their, their whole role is to find overpriced stuff, cosmetics, dehumidifiers, you know, find a product that's overpriced uh, and, and find a vent and, and use sort of the online economy to be able to replace that. And as the, the, the gentleman who wrote this article said, uh, we're going to get better products for ludicrously low prices as big brands are outcompeted by disruptors. Um, those of you that teach marketing or finance uh, should start feeling anxious right now because if brands aren't important, then much of what we teach in our marketing classes starts to get a little bit problematic. Um, of course, this may not be the utopian world that that, uh, that that author imagines. If somehow competitors on Amazon decide to use sleazy underhanded tactics in a marketplace that has no court system to adjudicate how competition works, and of course, that's the world that we're in now. There's also an industry of people that will write fake reviews with bad grammar to get you kicked off of Amazon. There are people that will find your brand and then trademark it and steal it from you. It's kind of a crazy, it's you know, research-wise fascinating, but it's a crazy wild west uh, out there in the world of Amazon. What this has left us with is a world that kind of was a thought experiment 30 years ago when I was in, or 40 years ago, back when I was in graduate school. Uh, Meyer and Rowan wrote, uh, the building blocks for organizations come to be littered around the societal landscape. It takes only a little entrepreneurial energy uh, to assemble them into a structure. And at the time they wrote in 1977, that was ridiculous. This is a world of conglomerates and vertically integrated firms, but they were kind of foreseeing where we might end up, a world of Lego blocks that could be snapped together into pop-up enterprises that I think was fairly poetic. So the story so far, um, through pervasive Nikeification, American corporations have outsourced pretty much every activity that they used to do internally. Not every, but an awful lot. Uh, the advent of Uberization has extended this to labor at all levels of skills. It's not just low level labor that could be Uberized, college professors. Um, I'm sure someone could, you know, Christo, I'm sure someone could come in and teach a class on how to calculate retained earnings. Uh, <laughs> Uh, for a lot cheaper than you and I might do it. So uh, net present value, a lot of people can explain that without getting business professor salaries. So it's not the level of skill, arguably it's the asset specificity that's gonna matter for that. And Amazon enables anyone to sell to a global marketplace. So as a result of this, anyone with a credit card and a web connection can essentially create a firm with minimal startup costs. I just wanna pause here for a moment to, to say, what I'm making here is a claim that I think is not as straightforward as it might seem. I am claiming here that information and communication technologies have radically changed the enabling markets for corporations. I didn't talk about capital markets because that would take a whole talk, uh, but supply, labor, and distribution markets, all of them have been radically reorganized because of ICTs. And that means that the kinds of firms that we're likely to get are going to look very different. Um, in particular, they don't need to be sort of public corporations. Okay, on to my favorite example of a pop-up enterprise. Uh, if you don't own an Instant Pot at this moment, you should log off this talk right now and go buy this because it's an amazing, it's an amazing appliance, the Instant Pot. It's sort of a slow cooker, fast cooker, pressure cooker with a lot of computer technology built into it. It's really a wonderful device that made the pandemic uh, more bearable. And I would say since the microwave, it's the only essential new appliance <laughs> that's really been created in the last uh, 50 years. But what's crazy about the Instant Pot is the story of how it arose and, and got to be this indispensable product. So it was designed and self-financed for about $350,000 by Robert Wang, who was an unemployed computer engineering PhD in Ontario. And he decided the world, I wanna be an entrepreneur, I don't wanna, I wanna work 
for myself and not for someone else. But the world doesn't need another dumb app for dating or whatever. What the world needs is a way to make healthy food fast for busy people, but using computer technology. And so he designed this thing prototype that uh, found a vendor in China to, to manufacture it and he launched it on Amazon. His marketing budget consisted of sending free instant pots to 200 food bloggers and cookbook authors uh, and, and telling them you might like this thing. And of course they did. And he read every single Amazon review to see what the users thought of his product and made improvements based on feedback from actual users. His distribution channel was a listing on amazon.com. That was it. Uh, in 2019, last year, Amazon sold over 300,000 of these things in one day on Prime Day. Currently, it's a $300 million a year product category, which is very large. The kicker, of course, is that the producer just had 50 employees in a sad strip mall somewhere outside Ottawa. So he's created an indispensable appliance that's huge in revenues, yet tiny in employment and assets. And in some sense, this feels like proof of concept that you can generate an enterprise with very few people and assets, but very large in revenues. And, you know, had it gone public, you know, arguably it might have been a pretty large market cap company. So that seems, you know, to me to be a, a, a fun proof of concept. It's not just Instant Pot, but that's one that I think most people are familiar with. So what comes next, and this is a bit of a speculation, but I, I think one that's pretty plausible is the idea of the web page enterprise. So what do I mean by a web page enterprise? Uh, if you ever found yourself reading the book Good to Great, which turns up in a lot of strategy classes, one of the case studies of a brilliant, wonderfully run, ingenious company is Circuit City, which is an appliance seller, uh, electronic seller in the US. Uh, inevitably, of course, it got liquidated in January 2009 and, and the, the parts sold off, so it doesn't exist anymore. But there was a company on Long Island in New York that bought the brand name and the web domain and the logo, and they went about meticulously recreating all of the stuff that Circuit City used to sell, but only on the web, and then connected it to order fulfillment services that would stick the name Circuit City on it. And so you could go to the Circuit City website, order all of the same stuff from the olden days and get that product, but it literally had no employees. It was an employee free organization. It was kind of like a hermit crab. They'd kind of moved in and occupied this existing brand name uh, and created a firm with no employees. I think we can go farther than that. So if you're under 40, you can sleep for the next two minutes, but if you're over 40 like me and, uh, maybe a couple of other folks. Um, web pages don't exist on their own. Web pages are created when you show up uh, at that HTML site and your computer uh, reads a bunch of HTML text and renders a web page using a browser. If you ever right click on a web page and go to view source, you can see the underlying code and it says what operating system, are you on a phone or are you on a on a laptop or a regular computer, what's your IP address, where are you in the world? It gathers a bunch of information and it renders a page. It renders an image that is distinct to you. So it's created on demand. And the way that this works is that it's a set of calls on SQL databases and other web pages and APIs, which is just a bunch of nerd talk. It goes out, gathers a bunch of data and puts it together to create this image for you. In some sense, what a web page does is not that different from what a firm does. It makes a set of calls on resources and follows a set of rules to put those things together to create a performance. And what I'm arguing here is that an awful lot of what management does, given what I've just described, could be reproduced or replaced by a web page. So imagine I say, I want a new 60 inch television mounted on my wall in Menlo Park, California. I could go to a web page and say 60 inch screen mounted on the wall. And that web page could go out and find how much for a screen, uh, how much for a processor, how much to assemble, how much to ship it, how much to find a vendor in Redwood City that'll pick it up at the, uh, at the shipyards and install it on my wall. And three milliseconds later, it will say, here's your price. In some sense, that is a firm. It is doing what a firm does by gathering resources and putting them together. 
hypothetical now in the same way that Uber seemed ridiculous in 2007 and inevitable 10 years later. It seems silly now, but technologically it's certainly possible. So what would a web page enterprise do? A web page enterprise would coordinate inputs to create outputs through software and algorithms rather than through hierarchy, much as a web page coordinates calls on resources to create output on a browser. So I'm claiming, I, I am predicting this to happen in the not too distant future that we will be seeing web pages that do what firms did. Uh, and in some sense, firms have already laid down the tracks for this through Nikeification and Uberization. The only question is who's going to design these things. Uh, bonus, why would you ever go public if you were a web page? If you don't have employees, if you don't have assets, what is your need to go to the public capital markets? And at this point, I have to say to the donors uh, for this lovely new center that Professor Karuna has put together, sorry about this. Uh, but it does suggest a pretty different face of what corporate government than swipe might look like. So story so far, this is overextending a bit. Public corporations are now unnecessary for production, unsuited for stable employment, and incapable of providing long-term return on investment. All right, that's a bit of an overstatement, but, uh, but let's roll with it. So what does corporate governance look like in a post-corporate world? I've made this claim that the constituent markets of the corporation, um, finance, capital, labor, supplies, uh, and, uh, and the distribution markets, as well as the internal management of firms can be done and is being uh, transformed by information and communication technologies. How do we govern these things? What will this look like? And I wanna give an optimistic view of this because another thing that's happened at the same time as what I've described is that capital goods have gotten dramatically cheaper. Computer numerically controlled goods such as uh, routers uh, and uh, CNC milling machines and so on. We're moving ever closer to the world that you saw in Minority Report where very low cost locavore factories that are sort of ge generally competent are becoming increasingly possible. So ShopBot's a fun example of that. Because of 3D printing in the web, you're seeing uh, the possibility of insta replication of physical objects. So much like Nike, you can imagine design taking place anywhere in the world, but production taking place locally. You might buy an encrypted piece of software that has one printing of a new set of Nike sneakers and then finding a local vendor to put that thing together um, using things like uh, 3D printing. Uh, currently, the ethos around, uh, around 3D printing tends to be pretty open source. It's kind of like software um, after Richard Stallman, where people did things like Linux. Hey, let's post it and make it free. I'm going to post free designs for different kinds of products. Thingiverse is an example of this. You can download designs for all kinds of products completely free and then take them to your local 3D printer uh, to, to create those things. We could imagine a universal fabrication facility in essentially every neighborhood. Um, and in fact, uh, Tech Shop was a version of this. It only costs about $2 million, at least 10 years ago, it cost about $2 million uh, to fund one of these things. So it's not incredibly costly and the costs keep going down. It's software that runs these things and they keep getting better and cheaper sort of day by day. Uh, the maker movement is taking off in places like Detroit and in surprising industries. There's now an online sort of collective of biotech where people create and share modules online for biotechnology. We're also seeing a movement towards more cooperatives in Cleveland and elsewhere. So not running like a traditional corporation, running by like a worker owned or, uh, uh, or community owned cooperative and it turns out that uh, in the United States, there's a pretty long history of non-corporate forms. And when I say that, you immediately think food co-op with big bins of oats and cement floors uh, and people wearing tie-dye. But surprisingly enough, through the history of the US, at least, there's been a long set of producer cooperatives. Land Lakes is uh, one of the biggest dairy cooperatives. Uh, Ace Hardware transitioned to a uh, a cooperative organization around 1973. So that's a chain of stores. 
uh, consumer-owned cooperatives like REI and credit unions, all of which by law are nonprofit organizations run for the benefit of their community, uh, and mutuals. So a lot of insurance companies in the U.S. are mutuals. What's maybe more surprising to many of us is that Vanguard, uh, the mutual fund, is a mutual itself as an organizational form. It's not family owned the way that sort of uh, Fidelity is or publicly owned like BlackRock. It is uh, mutually owned. The customers that buy shares through Vanguard are also the owners of Vanguard. And the last time I checked the 13F data, Vanguard is the largest shareholder of one in three Fortune 1000 corporations. Uh, ownership has gotten incredibly concentrated in the US. The big three um, index funds own about 22% of the S&P 500. And the biggest is Vanguard, which is a mutual, which sounds like a communistic hippie conspiracy of some sorts. Um, so these are not all businesses run by commies or hippies. There is a, there is a history of, uh, of entities that are not publicly listed corporations. And of course, we're seeing new legal forms that add to some of the mix of possibilities. Certified B corporations and benefit corporations have been around for a while. They're getting a bit of an uptick. They really, they don't do well on uh, public markets. Uh, Etsy was listed as a B corporation and within two years, it had abandoned being a certified B corporation back to being normal. As of today, I think there's two certified B corporations listed in the US. Um, it just does not seem to do well with shareholder capitalism, but it is a legal form and uh, many people don't realize that the LLC was not even a thing in Delaware until 1991. Now it's utterly pervasive. And so there is room for interesting creation of new legal forms of entity that don't look like traditional shareholder owned corporations. Um, this is a long quote that I'm going to skip. I'll tell you the short version. Uh, the kinds of organizations that you get depend on physical and market technology uh, and legal technology at the time that they're being created. So if you think two centuries ago, the steam engine enabled uh, a new kind of capitalism during the first industrial revolution, something that was designed to pull water out of uh, coal mines turned out to be useful for powering ships and locomotives and so on. The Model T and mass production really changed the way everything was done in society. Uh, about 100 years ago, including where my grandfather's worked. And we're now in this sort of new situation where smartphones enable markets for all kinds of things where there weren't markets before. But it's not inevitable how this turns off, turns out. It is really up to us. And it's really a political choice to figure out how do we create these new kinds of organizations. And I'll just leave it here with the the idea of open source institutional design for economic democracy. <laughs> there are you know, the contemporary world economy would not work without Linux, which really is created by hippies. It's a free product. Every server in the world essentially uses Linux. Without servers like that, we wouldn't have the cloud. We wouldn't have Amazon Web Services. We would not have businesses like, um, like Netflix that rely on Amazon Web Services. So in some sense, we've already got examples out there of non-corporate forms. Uh, we just have to figure out what they're going to look like. So. Great, thank you so much, uh, Professor Davis. That was a, a wonderful uh, presentation. And we've had some uh, good questions come through in the Q&A, and I, I wanted to um, ask you for a start, uh, there's a question kind of about um, the nature of the industries where you're seeing this. So uh, I think this is really, really quite helpful. And, and in some ways, maybe you answered it when you're talking about the, towards the end there, talking about the corporate form is based on physical market and, and legal kind of technology. But the, the question is, um, is there something about the nature of uh, the, the firms that have moved from being uh, shareholder corporations? Uh, is, is, it, is it something to do with finance? Is it, you know, like one of the questions was, would you see this in the car industry? So I, I'm just curious about, about your response to that question. Yeah, no, no, I love that question. So the, the kinds of firms where you don't see so much Nikeification um, tend to be those where the, the reliability and quality of the product are heavily regulated. Um, so Boeing, actually they have vertically disaggregated, I think to disastrous effect and, and we're seeing some of the results of that. 
Um, but it, but uh, car companies are ultimately responsible for the safety and reliability of those products. And so we don't see quite so much vertical disaggregation um, in those industries. But I would say, uh, yeah, so I, I'd say almost any other manufacturing industry, it, it's, it's not too crazy to imagine that in the not too distant future, we will have generic automakers that have ironed the bugs out uh, that work on the service and the distribution, but that contract with third-party vendors for the creation of those things. So I think it's not impossible. We haven't seen it yet, but I think it's not, not impossible to imagine that. I would say oil companies, if you're investing in very large-scale, long-lived assets, that still requires being a public corporation. If you have real assets and not just intellectual property, um, that's a situation where it still makes sense to be a public corporation or alternatively uh, to go to private equity. Uh, one of the things that's happened in the U.S. is private equity has enabled, um, has enabled investment funds to amass very large scales of capital, but in a non-market way. And so one of the, the surprising things that we've seen in the U.S. is almost every grocery store has now gone private. <laughs> Um, so maybe eight of the top 10 or so grocery stores, they have really large long-lived investments in real estate. They have employees, they have, they have real assets uh, for the most part, uh, but they've gone private because they figured out a way to amass capital, um, but run the business a bit differently. Um, so we, we are seeing some, I think, interesting innovations in financing that I didn't have quite as much chance to go into, but I wrote a book about it 11 years ago called Managed by the Markets. It's really good, so. <laughs> Can I just ask it around this? Um, I, I thought it was really terrific that you started off by talking about um, Ronald Coase's famous article, you know, The Theory of the Firm. Um, and what you've suggested is that really the, the, the major reductions that have happened through technology in, in transaction costs mean that we can substitute um, transactions for management, that the management costs have become much higher when at a time, for example, when, when Henry Ford was setting up his businesses in, in factory in R River Rouge, that, that was different. But one, one thing that I think is interesting here, Jerry, is that the, the corporation has also solved transaction costs for individuals. I mean, I'm thinking particularly in the US, you know, around healthcare services, uh, retirement funding, um, a range of different sort of social things that have been quite important for people's lives, presumably the lives of your, of your grandparents when they were working there. And I just wonder whether that's something that we should be concerned about, that this kind of disaggregation of the corporation uh, means that uh, a lot of those things that have been provided uh, as a sort of a spillover, a positive externality, if you like, of the corporation could be lost. Yeah, that's, uh, that's such a great question and one that keeps me awake at night. Um, I had, you know, to, to be honest, I had gone into this profession as a critic of the corporation. I thought they were the bad guys. And, you know, there's on, on many dimensions, they, 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 they have been the bad guys. But if you create a large enterprise like the Ford Motor Company or General Motors or AT&T, uh, it's possible to exert political pressure, either through sort of organized labor or through government regulation to get them to behave themselves. And I think what we saw over the course of the 20th century was, you know, going back to Teddy Roosevelt, who was president uh, a little over 100 years ago, he said, look, corporations are the cheapest way to get things done. You know, monopolies are often cheaper than the alternatives. And it's, so that's a good thing for consumers, but we don't want them, but, but we need to sort of keep them in shape. We need to find some vehicles to make them behave themselves. And so the effort of the progressive movement was to say, yeah, U.S. steel is going to be a lot cheaper than two dozen tiny steel mills. We have to have some vehicle to get them to behave themselves. And over the course of the 20th century, what we saw was corporations taking on more and more of the social welfare functions, providing people with uh, career ladders, the possibility to move into the middle class like, uh, like my grandparents arguably did, uh, providing access to health care and benefits, uh, charitable donations, taking care of their local town. You know, a lot of corporations became very good citizens. Think about AT&T and Bell Labs. A lot of really good things came out of uh, well-behaved uh, monopolists and oligopolists. Uh, they provided a kind of stability and a legible map for people to be able to plan their lives out. Um, when, I was, uh, uh, when I was Christo's age back in the crustacean era, 
uh, my parents would say, look, the, the, the secret to a successful life is study hard in school and get a job with a name brand corporation like Xerox or GE. And you know, once you get there, you'll be able to work your way up and uh, they'll take care of your retirement for you. And that's just gone. Uh, we really don't have that same legible map for stability. Uh, and I think, I, so that was a very long answer to your question, but I think there are some, some of the social functions of the corporation that we're just not getting with these tiny all contractor organizations. Yeah, look, thanks for that, Jerry. And I really like the way that you um, uh, brought in the important role that government played in regulating those big corporations. And, and that leads to a, a question actually that was asked by, um, sorry, by someone here, I just, um, I'm blank seeing their name, uh, anonymous attendee actually. Uh, anonymous attendee asked the question, um, what about substitute regulation for these, uh, for, for the kind of forms that you're seeing, the Nikeification, the, the Amazonization, um, and, and the, the last one there was the, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, the Uber, Uberization. So, so, you know, this has been an issue. I know, for example, with taxi drivers who were heavily regulated being very upset about Uber coming on the scene. So, so what, what do you see in terms of um, regulation of these very kind of diffuse uh, uh, systems? Yeah, no, uh, that's a lovely question. So I have a recent paper with a brilliant doctoral student whom you should hire in the future. His name is Asim Sinha, just mad, mad props to Asim. Uh, but uh, in, in his dissertation and in our early work, we look at the implementation of the Uber, the basic idea of Uber in eight different countries around the world. Uh, so the US, Nigeria, Indonesia, India, Sweden, Germany, and I'm probably blanking on one there. But the, the startling thing is the basic idea of Uber is use a smartphone to match drivers and riders. That's it. I mean, that is the basic premise behind Uber. And we think, well, inevitably, that'll look like Uber. <laughs> uh, but around the world, it looks that same basic idea gets implemented in radically different ways in different economies. And so sort of the, um, the social organization or the institutional structure of the economy really radically changes the way the same technology gets implemented. And so the reason, I think that the reason the Canadian CEOs were saying, oh, that would never happen. We'll never see something like this employee-free Walmart is because in Canada, that would just be inconceivable. <laughs> it would violate their labor laws, um, that uh, they already have a, you know, nationalized healthcare in the way that the United States does not. And so they just couldn't conceive of the technology being used in that way. So my sense is that, that national institutions and politics uh, really radically shape the way that technology is going to be used. I'm in California and it re California recently passed a state law that says Uber and Lyft and similar platform companies, um, those people that you're calling contractors are actually your employees. So you better start treating them like employees and meeting a minimum wage. Um, that might drive them out of business. <laughs> and so, uh, so that it, really the way that the technology, the way that the ICTs get implemented depend quite critically on what's legal and what are the national institutions enable. That's why I think it's up to us as academics to think how to create uh, an institutional structure that allows these things to be great and humane and give us variety and, and meet human needs and not just pay off the venture capitalists down the street uh, on Sand Hill Road. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. You know, a, a couple of questions that I think might be related, but I'll, I'll just, you know, maybe put them to you and see if you want to answer them separately or together. One was, uh, how would these new corporate forms address things like climate change? So I think it's a sort of a collective action problem that comes back a little bit to the, the agglomeration of, of management capability within the corporation can, can address things like that. So how would climate change be, be resolved with these kind of decentralized systems? Another question, another question that I think sort of gets at the same thing around the agglomeration of management talent was really asking, so how does innovation happen? I mean, I know you've talked about a lot of really cool innovation here, uh, but in some ways you could see, I think, with, let's say, Bell Labs uh, as, as a classic example of a corporation that was very careful to uh, manage its innovation processes. And what you're seeing here is this, this such disaggregation. How does innovation get managed there? Not necessarily does it happen. It's clearly happening, but how does it get managed? So I, I wonder if you could answer those questions. Yeah, I, I will do my best. The first one is a really hard one. 
um, because, you know, um, people have a lot of bad things to say about Walmart and they have over the years, but when Walmart decides we're going to require all of our large suppliers to document the carbon in their supply chain and reduce it, that just has a huge effect. You know, Walmart is like the sun around which the retail economy planets orbited, you know, back before Amazon. And so they really had a capacity, if they chose to do so, to squeeze carbon out of the supply chain and they had the power to do that. Um, how do you do that if suddenly what you've got is a much more dispersed economy? So I think it's, I, I think that we don't have a great way currently. I think we have figured out, uh, at least in the US, how to deal with giant corporations. You know, through, you could have the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, require firms to report on their use of conflict minerals from the Democratic Republic of Congo, which actually happened in the Dodd-Frank Act 10 years ago. Um, and so that's something you can do with publicly listed companies and big companies. It's a lot harder to do with a tiny local co-op. I think one answer, and I, I think for the carbon footprint, just because we're seeing this breakdown of the traditional global trade system in various ways, and I don't know if you've been following politics in the U.S., but there's some peculiarities going on currently. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I have a lot of hope for the U.S. and China becoming best friends again in, in the near future. Um, but a lot of what I've described was enabled by supply chains extending into China uh, and China's accession to the World Trade Organization in December 2001. What could replace that world? Imagine that, that trade breaks off the way that it did around the time of World War I. You could imagine having a much more carbon-friendly, locally controlled uh, fab lab economy. So imagine if instead of getting my, uh, my uh, IKEA bookshelves shipped from uh, who knows where <laughs> in particle board, if instead I went to my local fab lab and said, I need, some, uh, I need some bookshelves. Can you go use local plywood or this tree that fell down in my backyard and make one of these uh, on a router? It, it feels to me that if you can take transport out and do on-demand production at local fab labs, then that would be the place that you would want to work on, uh, on reducing carbon, is by creating fab labs that are themselves very carbon friendly and locally controlled and accountable. Uh, so that's, that's my, my ideal for this sort of uh, ideal future is a circular economy organized around local fab labs that, that I hope would address that. And, I, I could see a couple of steps to get from here to there. Um, I want to make sure I'm, I'm mindful of time because we got two minutes. Um, so the second question, can you remind me again? Yeah, it was around the, the management of innovation. Right. Um, so it's interesting when you think, where did all of the best innovations, the, the, the ingenious innovations that we think of today, like uh, Google using eigenvector centrality as a way to index websites. That was done by a couple of grad students at Stanford you know, in a garage doing an NSF grant. Uh, where'd the idea from Salesforce come from? Where'd the idea from Linux? Uh, a lot of these things are really, um, the innovations are created by people either individually or in dispersed ways. And I'm gonna say something very, some, something that was surprisingly optimistic to me is that in the face of COVID, you saw this radical dispersed effort to come up with new designs um, the, for drugs to some extent, but for say creating ventilators using locally available materials. And I was really heartened to see that it was almost like Wikipedia for designing a ventilator. Okay, we have a great shortage of these things. What can I buy at Bennings? Uh, what can I manufacture with a 3D printer? And people were sharing designs and adding to them online. And so you saw this global effort enabled by information technology to come up with better and better and more accessible designs for ventilators. And that just seemed kind of impossible. But then when you see the product you come up, they come up with, you think, this is great. And because it's open source, um, later today, you can go online and try and improve things or come up with an alternative or a cheaper way to do it or a more carbon, way, carbon friendly way to do it. So in some sense, we can all collaborate in creative ways collectively around the world because of ICTs. Um, the capacity for us to work together and create something, you know, like Linux or like a design for a ventilator, that seems, uh, that just seems like a, a real source of optimism to me. It's not the same as Bell Labs, but uh, 
uh, but, but I think it could be pretty interesting. That's fantastic, Jerry. I'm going to leave the questions there. There was one last set, but I think you've actually answered them or started along that track, and that was really around the current COVID-19 uh, challenges. Uh, does that lead us to more sort of localised production rather than worrying about global supply chains? And I think that your point about this uh, this rise of innovative uh, production at the local level uh, and, and, and the surprise about how quickly that's come back, I think perhaps starts us along that, that line. And the other question was more, I think, uh, around the, perhaps the regulation of Uber drivers, that, you know, the Uber drivers uh, have, have been blamed sometimes for spreading the, the virus. They're super spreaders. So, you know, what would we do in, in, in regard to that? But maybe we could just ponder that point. I think it's a, it's a good one, and I'll, I'll pass back to... Um, to Christo, but uh, I just say thank you so much, Jerry. Wonderful, uh, wonderful presentation and, and great answers to the questions. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate it. Great. Well, th thank you, Jerry. Uh, it's been a fantastic uh, um, webinar. Um, I mean, it's very stimulating. I think what you did was to nicely, there's a lot of analysis, I, I suppose, and research that went into your ideas and the ability that you, you had to actually nicely weave in your insights with a, a, the, the applied focus and with a lot of humor uh, was, was fascinating. So thank you, uh, it was really great. Um, and it's, it's really useful for us, especially as we think about how the modern corporation and especially how, or not the modern corporation, but rather modern forms that evolve and, and the governance implications for these forms are, are, are certainly something that's interesting and a challenge for the future. Uh, so thank you for that, uh, for a fantastic webinar talk. Uh, Professor Mintram, thank you as well for moderating the webinar in a very effective way. There were quite a few questions that I think you did a really nice job at weaving everything in, combining all the insights and posing the questions uh, to, uh, to Jerry to answer as well. So thank you very much. We had a really cool, kind of a good discussion here, which was excellent. Now I'd like to just close by just um, mentioning that the International Consortium for Values-Based Governance as part of the Center for Global Business at Monash University strongly advocates governance that is based on the institution's context. Today, we've been exposed to issues related to modern organization forms and you know, the digital aspects of it, et cetera. So I kind of encourage you to think about and apply these ideas discussed in this webinar to your respective fields. So thank you once again for attending this webinar and I hope you attend our future webinars on, on other stimulating topics. So please look after yourself and others during these times. Goodbye, have a nice day. <laughs>